Today I want to talk about who's given the credit for the discovery of DNA. And the answer is, it was a lot of people, but most of the time there are there is a pair of guys who are given most of credit for it, but we'll get to them. Let's start with the first guy in the late 1800s. His name was Friedrich Meisner. And what Meisner did is he was able to take white blood cells and take the nucleus of them and figure out that there's stuff inside the nucleus. And the stuff that he found inside the nucleus he called nuclein. Today we call it nucleic acid, which is such as DNA. Then, after him, there's a guy named Phoebus Levine, and what Phoebus Levine did is that he was able to take the nucleic acids from the nucleus and figure out that they're made of nucle nucleotides, and that the nu nucleotides were made of the deoxyribosugar, the phosphate group, and the one of four nitrogenous bases, but he was not able to figure out what it looked like. Then, there's a guy named Erwin Chargoff, and Chargoff figured out that no matter what DNA he took, out of no matter what organism it was, that the amount of adenine, the amount of A's, always equaled the amount of T's in every organism, and the amount of C's always equaled the amount of G's in every organism. So adenine and thymine were always in equal amounts, and cytosine and guanine were always in equal amounts of every organism. Now he, we, we did not know about base pairing yet, and so this is a lot of information from him was used by other scientists to figure out the structure of DNA. Then there's a guy named Frederick Griffith, and he did his experiment in the mid to late 20s. And what Griffith did is that he did this kind of complex experiment that I'm not going to go into the details of, about he had some mice and he injected them with different strains of bacteria, and some of them lived and some of them didn't, based on what he did to the bacteria. But in the end, he couldn't really figure out why the results ended the way that they did. And so what happened was that later on, this trio of men here, Avery, McLeod, and McCarty, they redid Griffith's experiment with the mouse, the mice, and the bacteria. And they were able to add a little bit, add a little different twist to the experiment. And from their version of the experiment, they were able to figure out that the purpose of DNA is the genetic material. And nobody thought that because DNA was such a simple, it was only made of a few things, four things, four different bases, a sugar and a phosphate. Nobody thought that DNA w could be as important as being the genetic material. People at this time thought it was probably proteins instead, but their research said otherwise, but nobody believed them. So there was more experimentation. It's important that, you know, some scientists, you, in the scientific community, you can't just do one experiment and expect the entire world to kind of say, okay, if you say so, there has to be a lot of evidence that backs it up. And so more experimentation was done over the next several decades. And during that time, there were a scientist pair named Hershey and Chase who worked together, and they did another similar experiment. And they were actually working with bacteria and viruses that infected bacteria. And what they figured out from their experiment, they compared proteins and DNA, and they figured out from their experiment that DNA is indeed the genetic material, not proteins. And so this is was kind of like the big experiment that pushed the scientific community over the edge, and they started in saying, oh yeah, DNA, it's a genetic material. And so the race to figure out what DNA looked like and its structure was on. So in the 40s and early 50s, these people were trying to figure out what it looked like. And so there's a guy named Linus Pauling, and Linus Pauling kind of proposed that DNA was a triple helix. Now, we know that's not right today, but that's what he proposed. And at the same time, there is a pair, James Watson and Francis Crick, and what Watson and Crick said is that, no, it's a double helix. But even though Watson and Crick were more correct, their structure was incorrect. It was off completely. They had their base pairs. They, they didn't have the base pairs in the middle. They had bases sticking off the outside, which didn't even make sense chemically. So they kept on trying to figure out what it looked like. And it wasn't until these two, and the, they were chemists and biochemists, Rosalind Franklin and Maurice Wilkins, they worked together. And actually, they, didn't, they worked in the same lab doing a technique called X-ray crystallography. And what this method did was it took a chemical molecule and it took an x-ray picture of it. And it was from this picture, they were able to figure out through mathematical 
algorithm, I'm sure, what a molecule actually looked like three-dimensionally. So Rosalind Franklin took this picture of DNA, and the, this is the famous picture. It's called Photo 51. And it, there's this classic, you could see this X shape going down the center of it. And she didn't release this information yet to any other scientists who were studying DNA because she wanted to make sure that she knew what it meant. And so while she was figuring that out, Maurice Wilkins, her partner, took her photograph and showed the photograph to Watson and Crick. And Watson and Crick immediately, it was like the light bulb went on and they knew that X pattern meant a double helix with the base pairs on the inside. And so they went ahead and made their model and were given credit in 1953 for figuring out the structure of DNA. So Watson and Crick are the guys who are always associated with the structure of DNA, but it was many other people, especially Rosalind Franklin, who actually helped them put the finishing touches on that discovery. Now Watson and Crick, along with Maurice Wilkins, were given the Nobel Peace Prize in 1962 for the discovery of the molecule, and Rosalind Franklin was not given the Nobel Prize, nor was she even mentioned too much. She was given very little association or credit. Now, one of the reasons she didn't win the Nobel Prize is because she actually passed away from ovarian cancer at a very young age of 38, I believe. And um, I think her research, which was with x-rays, led to her cancer and death. And they don't give the Nobel Peace Prize to people who have died, only the living. But overall, there's still very little credit given to her, but nowadays we know that she played a vital, vital part, and she's a very important scientist that people need to know about. So I thought it's kind of interesting. All these experiments go into great detail, and there's excellent videos out there that tells the details of each one of these scientists' experiments, but I think this is a good kind of glimpse of each one of them. All right, hopefully, hopefully this was interesting. Thanks. Bye.